We're talking Pac-12 football coming up this season. It is the spring, so why not discuss what we think is going to happen with the great Max Brown, a former USC quarterback, a former five-star recruit, and now is doing work with Sirius XM, USC all over broadcasting fronts. And I'm going to continue this introduction of him, and it's going to be longer than what is to be advised as a quarterback and how long you should hold the football after getting the ball snapped to you. There's so many different ways and, and, and different things to say as far as Max Brown's resume from his USC playing days to then going on to Pittsburgh to like we said what he's doing in the broadcasting realm now YouTube channel I encourage every single one of you to subscribe to his YouTube channel. He is starting to go viral. He's also breaking down all the NFL draft quarterback prospects. So really interesting insights from Max there, finding himself in a great space of analysis. And what an opportunity to have him here to talk some Pac-12 football, a little preview show, if you will. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. Max, thank you so much for doing this. And also, I wanted to make sure I included that the Seattle Times did an incredible article on you, a long form piece that really showed your true self and the struggles that you've gone through. And would love to ask you about that later on in this conversation as well. But somebody like yourself, who is so entrenched in the USC football program to this day and keeping tabs of what is going on, it is a program that comes into this season, obviously looking like the favorite out of the South. And it all starts with their quarterback in Keaton Slovis. If you were Keaton Slovis's quarterbacks coach this off season, Max, what are you telling him? What can he add to his game that he hasn't showed us so far on the football field? Yeah. First off, thanks for having me on Brian. Always fun to, to link up. And even with all the new irons in the fire, it's good to get back to the, uh, the, the day one roots, which is Pac-12 football for me. You mentioned the YouTube channel. That's how it got uh, off the ground, breaking down Pac-12 ball. So Always good to be always good to be back uh, talking the, the conference of champions. But uh, yeah, with with Keaton Slovis, I think it, it's always interesting in, in USC land because the quarterbacks. Anytime you start at, at quarterback at USC, you become a Heisman candidate at least in in the off season. And especially when you make that jump from hey, you're a freshman sophomore to now you're a junior. Now you're the leader of the team. Now you're kind of it's your time. It's your window to make something happen. It's happened with every other USC quarterback that started for a long time there going back to uh, Kessler, Darnold, Barkley, when you get to that junior, senior year, then it's time to cash it in. Then it's time, hey, there's no more growing. There's no more, hey, th that's going to be a valuable game experience for the future. Like now it's time to really rock and roll. And I think that's, that's the answer to your question is you want to see Keaton Slovis level up in all of the areas. I think we're used to seeing him make one or two big time throws a game, but can he do that possession in and possession out? Can he, can he minimize the catastrophic mistake. And early on, I mean, I know it was only a five game season in the fall, but early on, I remember being on the pre and post game radio show, show talking about, Hey, he's playing well, but man, there's a lot left in the tank. Some of those balls are coming off his hands a little goofy. Some of there's missed opportunities there. And can he really rise and become the most feared player in the PAC 12 conference, a Heisman trophy candidate. That's the expectation that I see. And rightfully so, because I think he's got all the talent in the world. There's a lot of wide receiver talent at USC as well that he's been able to work with in the past. And guys like Amon Ross St. Brown and Tyler Vaughn seemingly moving on to their aspirations in the NFL. So I'm curious. I know you've got Drake London there sort of manning things in the wide receiver room for USC. But how do you think the new, new dynamic of the wide receiver room with some younger pieces, how that will affect the effectiveness of your quarterback there in Keaton Slovis? No, it's a great question. I think the, the first part of that answer is USC has weapons at receiver. They're going to be just fine. But the second part of that question is they have some unique pieces. They have Gary Bryant, who's your, he's a small receiver who could be the slot specialist, or he could be the Deshaun Jackson home run threat that can take the top off the defense. They brought in a grad transfer, which at, from, uh, from Colorado, ironically, and Katie Nixon, a guy that I love when it was the one, two punch with LaVisca Chenault and Katie Nixon. Now the Trojans, the rich get richer, I guess you could say, and they find him. But both guys are small um, slot type bodies. And Drake London has found the role of the new 2021 new school tight end, who he's always been inside. So with three guys inside, you have vacancies with on the outside with guys leaving. It's just interesting to me of, of how the coaching staff will play a, a game of musical chairs, for lack of a better term, in, in terms of, hey, we have the bodies 
but how do we formation them? How do we position those guys in the right spot? But SC has some playmakers. Drake London's the, the big night, big time uh, guy. You have uh, a Kyle Ford outside who guys are excited about and they have names there. They'll be just fine. The biggest question for me is just uh, how all those guys piece together. And I can see Graham Harrell doing some very unique form formation things as well. We were talking receivers, the running backs, they have three or four of those guys as well. So you could see some unique personnel packages uh, in 2021 if I, if I had to put my money somewhere. Max Brown is with us. I'm Brian Fenley. It was interesting, Max, to hear Clay Helton the other day talk about how ideally he would like a couple ball carriers getting like combined 40 carries a game. He said like, yeah, if we had our number one bell cow getting like 25 snaps or getting the rock 25 times on carries and then the number two second stringer with 15 I'm like how is that possible when you run an air raid offense but the other thing is the offensive line and I know if people have talked about where that might be the sore spot for this team where are you with that offensive line and where do you think it really needs to clean things up the number one question for the conference at large could be USC's left tackle. I mean, if USC finds an answer at left tackle and that allows the program to take the next step, then the conference as a whole uh, might reap the benefits of that if SC can kind of get to the next level. So yeah, the left and right tackle for USC could very well be the, I mean, it's fun talking quarterbacks, fun talking new coaches and hot seats and all that, but left and right tackle for SC could be the most crucial storyline there. Um, but that to me is, uh, for a few years now, we've been saying, hey, for S SC's never taken a backseat at the skill position uh, to really anyone, I would say that. But the, where they have taken a big backseat is the front seven relative to the Alabamas, the Clemsons, and even um, an Ohio State or Oklahoma, or even that, that the notch down a little bit there. Um, they have some guys there. They took a big class in the 2020 recruiting class that now have been on campus for a full, uh, full year now that I think they need some of those guys to jump out. But that's a huge question to me. If I'm Clay Helton, that's my number one goal is if I can at least go into fall camp having a uh, solid five there that I feel confident about, then that's, that, that's a win for USC coming out of spring ball. And you mentioned the running back position with SC. Clay Helton's going to make uh, a lot, of, lot more fans even more emotionally exhausted uh, <laughs> if he keeps saying lines like that because that's, yeah. that's, that's been the problem, right, is they've been doing this running back by committee. And Mike Jenks has, has gone on record, their running back coach, and says, hey, we need to find a starting running back. Last year, they tried to get cute. They invented a, what was the position? They invented like a T position on offense to have like, they had four running backs. So they gave like the, the scat backs, like uh, I'm the starting scat back kind of thing. But that's, that's not real life. You have to, I think you have to have a starter. And USC paid the price of that a little bit. They had marquee step transfer um, out because, and when you try to make everyone happy and feed everyone's mouths, then as a result, you can kind of have guys have a hard time getting rhythm and whatnot. And I look for SC, whether it's Vavai uh, Milipea, who I played with, whether it's Stephen Carr, whether it's some of the youngsters coming in, they have dudes, but I think they have to find a starting running, running back to really get the, get guys in rhythm and find a rhythm as, as an offense as a whole. We saw the aforementioned Malapai do big work against UCLA in that USC-UCLA game last year. And that was a contest where, to be frank, and you know this, Max, the Bruins up double digits in the second half, and they hit that late field goal, and then just some, some breakdowns and special teams for UCLA, and they end up losing that game. As far as what UCLA is showing this year, there seemed to be some promise from this program after the small sample size. I know it was a three and four record in, in the shortened season last year, but the fact is you, you had a double digit lead against USC. You, you should have won against Stanford. You were up by double digits with like three minutes to go in the fourth quarter. You go into to double overtime and then lose it. But at the center of their offense is another quarterback with a little bit different skill set than Keaton Slovis at USC and Dorian Thompson Robinson. And the key for him, Max, certainly has to be being healthy because at the end of the last season, you saw Trace, Chase Griffin have to step up, but he did some admirable things. But what are you saying to a guy like Dorian Thompson Robinson as far as how he can rejuvenate this offense and get them to a bowl, a place that the Bruins haven't been to in a couple of years? Yeah, I think I would try to flip the script uh, with that. And it feels like that's been the narrative for a few years now of, hey, this is DTR's show and he's got to essentially be kind of Superman for the Bruins to have a chance. And I think we've seen that that's not necessarily the best blueprint for the Bruins because when DTR is playing Superman, that's where the turnovers come. 
That's where the bad plays come. That's where the injuries come potentially. And so I think for DTR, once again, we talked about Keaton Slovis becoming an upperclassman with DTR. Now he's been around the block. He's the, he's the old guy in the room. Now, can he just take what the defense gives him? He's talented enough to just play within the offense. And he's got enough athleticism where, Hey, even if he isn't perfect in the past game, he can still make things happen with his legs. And there's a very interesting kind of timeline with a lot of the PAC 12 schools. That's one of the more interesting storylines for me is you have these coaches that have been around the PAC 12 for a little while now, and they've kind of set the foundation for their program. And now it's time to execute. Now it's time to either take your program to the next level and you're going to be a, a main stage head coach in the PAC 12, or you don't, take to that, ne that, that next step. And we're kind of in that another cycle where we might see another batch of coaches come if that kind of happens. Chip Kelly, obviously in his fourth year, but last year I was super impressed with UCLA's defensive line play, the pass rush there. And that's a sign of guys getting more mature, kind of the younger guys they were counting on. They had a big turnover last year in their roster. You have more guys uh, acclimated to the program, more guys used to that scheme and that system. And are they, is everyone able to get more comfortable and level up? That's what you got to hope for as a, as a Bruin fan. But with SC not being elite, which we've said that since I was there, and Utah not being elite either necessarily, and ASU, and that's another team we haven't necessarily touched on, there is an opera, there is a window there for a Pac-12 South team to take a, take a step and really never look back, potentially for the next decade if they, if they hit it right, uh, like we've seen with, with, with teams in the past kind of laying the foundation for their program. Well, let's go right there to ASU because they've been recruiting very well, especially in Southern California. They're getting a lot of guys in California thanks to the way in which they've been able to, to get guys to their program. They had a big sort of COVID situation last year that compromised their season even more than what the shortened season already was as far as games were concerned. But then you have their, their quarterback and Jaden Daniels and – where are you with him? When you put out your grading report of him, where does he stand? For me, the ASU schedule, the Max Brown ASU schedule has not changed the past two years. This time last year, Brian, if we did a podcast, everyone was talking about, can ASU make the big jump? This is ASU's, are they, are they the team that's going to shock the country? We weren't even talking conference. And I, and I, I said, no, we got to slow our roll. ASU had, in 2019, way too many offensive line struggles. That jump they had to make, to me, was too extreme. And I would say, hey, watch out for 2021. That's when ASU can make their jump. And that was kind of pre-COVID a little bit and pre-all of ASU's specific COVID issues. But now it's time for ASU to cash in. I feel like the timing's right. They have the quarterback. They have the head coach. They've had the recruiting. They have the mojo. They have the window of opportunity in the Pac-12 South. To me, it's kind of now or never for ASU. You're never going to get the dominoes to align in a better fashion if you're an ASU fan to really take control of the Pac-12 South or at least be a main stage in the conference for years to come. There's just too many things aligned in the right direction that you have to have to cash in now. And Jaden uh, Daniels, all the hypes uh, for real. There's a reason that's the case. I think I'd love for them to level up at the receiver position, be more consistent there. Um, and just like any of these Pac-12 teams, if you can find an answer in the trenches and be, I don't know if a, a Pac-12 team's ever going to outdo an SEC team in terms of in the trenches, but if you can at least be competitive there and at least um, kind of find your find your your grind there a little bit, that's that that's a that's a recipe for success. And I'd expect big things for ASU as I think uh, anyone would. But the timeline for me hasn't changed and it's kind of always been 2021 when you talked about even a, a Herm Edwards time frame with his whole process as well. I think the lack of big bodies in the trenches is why on the Pac-12 side you see a Pac-12 team get into the college football playoff but as soon as they get there it's, it's almost game over. Who do you think out of all the 12 teams in the Conference of Champions has the best guys up front on both sides of the ball? Is, is it an Oregon? Is it who, who do you look for in that category? Yeah, it's got to be Oregon, I think. And uh, this whole conversation we've had, it's kind of been through an offensive lens. But with Oregon, you flip the script, and that's where the kind of the defensive lens comes up. But I don't think Oregon takes a back seat in a physicality nature defensively to not many teams in the country. Maybe Alabama, maybe Clemson, maybe Ohio State. Outside of that, Oregon's right there. We've seen the way they've recruited. We've seen the way that they've had impact players as youngsters play for the Ducks, and now they're getting older. And that's kind of kind of been a similar theme we've been talking about is a lot of these guys, hey, it's, it'll be exciting to watch them for years to come. Well, those years to come are now. And so uh, with Oregon, I think the big question for them is going to be quarterback, but defensively, 
you got to be excited about what Oregon's done. We've known what Oregon's done in the past offensive line wise with Joe Moorhead getting into year two with Oregon. They got a lot of pieces that are trending in the right direction, but at any level, if you don't have a quarterback, you can't win. And so that's obviously the Ducks' uh, biggest question in this entire offseason. Yeah, Ducks know they need to, to clean up some things on the defensive end and get rid of some of those deficiencies. But yeah, as far as the quarterback front for the Ducks, here you have this, this highly recruited quarterback, the new guy in Ty Thompson. And then you have Anthony Brown, who's been around in college football before I was born, it seems. And so what do you do there? Do you go with a guy? Let's say you're the head coach in this circumstance, Max. Do you go with a proven leader? Anthony Brown, who you've seen a lot of his work already, so maybe you know his ceiling, or do you take the risk and go young, given that maybe more mistakes could be made, but also a chance for a higher ceiling and go with the youngster and Ty Thompson? Yeah, two big things come up there for me. I think one, Oregon brings in Anthony Brown a year ago for a reason. Um, I think any main, st- any main stage Division One quarterback – or Division One school, but like Oregon, they're not just bringing in a random guy. And I say that because they must have seen some on film that they liked. Obviously, Tyler Shuck wasn't elite, but did enough to at least be serviceable and make Oregon kind of competitive there. But you want Anthony Brown to take the next step. And he did some good things at, at Boston College. And I was excited. I thought he was going to start for Oregon last year. And I mean, that's that, I, don't, I don't need to uh, go down that story necessarily. But with, uh, with Ty Thompson, Highly regarded, rightfully so. To me, I wa- I've watched enough of his high school film. I do have concerns about him jumping to the next level. His high school offense, from my eyes, was not overly complex. He wasn't asked to do as much as some high school quarterbacks. What I mean by that is in terms of, of processing reads. A lot of it was the half rolls and the rolling out, and which is awesome when, you, when you're in high school because Ty Thompson, athletic kid, really kind of lean on his skill set there. But I worry about, all right, can Ty Thompson make the jump? And so that's the second factory for me is how fast is number 13, or I guess I don't know what his number is now at Oregon, but how fast does he adjust to the division one level? And if he is making that jump and there isn't a big learning curve, then I think you got to go with the young guy and have him kind of be the future uh, and allow him to grow with your program. But if, if that's not the case and there's a reason so many uh, young quarterbacks redshirt, then let's go with Anthony Brown, a guy who has done good things, does have the, the dual threat capability and, have him just say, hey, let's, let's not play Superman once again. Uh, lean on the great playmakers that Oregon has. And that's kind of how I look at the, uh, the quarterback there. But anytime you've played Division One football, real life reps, that gives you a huge leg up. And so I'd expect Anthony Brown to play, but we'll see. We're talking with Max Brown of Sirius XM, USC Athletics, former Trojan quarterback. Also go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Follow him on Instagram and Twitter. I'm Brian Fenley, an anchor at FSR. As far as the Bay Area schools with Cal and Stanford, there was a lot of discussion and hype going into last season for the Bears as far as having Chase Garbers around. But, you know, they had a lot of issues with COVID. And so you wonder that their down year, perhaps that, it was a fluke or maybe this wasn't really their identity, but you have a team in Cal that has a, a, a solid quarterback that's been around in the program for a couple of years. And then on the Stanford side, no more Davis mills. And so they're kind of teeing around and toying around with different quarterbacks. Who do you think has the better year coming up as far as the Bay area schools? Is it Cal? Do they rebound off that down year a season ago, or is it Stanford who finds an answer at quarterback and then also figures out how to play some defense too? Yeah, you can make an argument for both schools for sure. I think anytime you have the a, a solid quarterback answer, I think that gives uh, that that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. So I'll go with the Cal Bears. And once again, talk about timeline timelines and building programs. Justin Wilcox been there for a few years. It feels like, hey, if 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 you're going to make the jump, now's the time to do it. Every year, there's always one team in the Pac-12, or at least one team that does make that jump. Last year, I would argue it was Oregon State with Jonathan uh, Smith kind of going from a mediocre football team to at least a competitive football team. Obviously, they're not winning championships, but if you're going into Corvallis nowadays, it's not you're not writing that off as an easy win. And so who's that team that can make the, the next jump? And I think both Bay Area schools, you can make a good argument for. Chase Garbers and Cal, rightfully so, rightfully so got some playmakers coming back. And to me, That's the biggest question. Can Cal find a way to be, they were below average at the skill skill position uh, in terms of receivers from, from my vantage point, can they level up? They got a good running back. I love Chris Brown and their running back, 
Can the rest of the offense level up? You know they're going to be at least solid defensively with Justin Wilcox. On the Stanford side, their Achilles heel last year was playing a lot of young guys. And because of COVID and injury and all the chaos there. But then the flip side of that is that while it sucks in the rear view, or while it sucks when you're living in it, when you fast forward a year or two, that gives a lot of guys experience. And especially with Stanford where they're going to roll out eight, nine offensive linemen a game kind of thing, that can be a huge advantage if you get some young guys experience. They're able to grow and develop and um, – don't ever anytime it's a David Shaw coach team anytime it's a disciplined team like Stanford don't ever write them off so you can make an argument for both I like Cal a little bit better but uh no easy wins versus either Bay Area teams this year leveling up in terms of Utah they did not live up to to what they had been doing in years prior last year but they have a couple questions at quarterback as well they've got a a transfer and and there's also Cameron rising and, and and all the discussion here is how do you replace Jake Bentley but do you feel like this is a team that that has tapered off a bit like their defense is always going to be so stout and one of the most formidable in the conference but when you think about the top teams out of the south is it is it USC and then do you go Utah or that they can get to number two Utah or or is UCLA there where are you with Utah in terms of them rebounding uh, off a, a so-so year in in their eyes yeah, I would word it very uh, similarly to how you just did right there in terms of USC is my favorite. And then I put ASU as a, uh, the second team on their own. And then three, I, I'll go Utah and UCLA right there. I mean, just for this one year, if you're talking about like strength of program entirely and over the next decade, I mean, Utah is as rock solid as, uh, as any of the programs. But a couple of times in our conversation, you've heard me talk about like windows of opportunity and executing when it's your time. For me, that window of opportunity was 2019 for Utah. They had the defense. They had the NFL guys. It was that. They had the, the veteran quarterback that had been there for four years. That was the time to make it. And while they had a great season that year, I think that it left a lot of fans in Salt Lake kind of bummed out because they knew what I was talking about in that if they were going to win a Rose Bowl, get to a Rose Bowl, win a Pac-12 title, that was the time they had to do it. And so I think to answer your question, they have tapered off. I think they're always going to be a competitive team. Going into Salt Lake's always going to be a tough place to play, especially with Winningham as the head coach. But I think they have taken a step back, and it's going to take some time for them to kind of get um, some of the, the the younger guys. Or they always are playing older guys, but some of those NFL quality guys there. But with grad transfer Charlie Brewer coming in from Baylor, that's really exciting for me. I think Utah's kind of really gone back to the, the 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 grad transfer market, I guess you could say. Didn't necessarily work out per se with Jake Bentley last year. Charlie Brewer, he's played a lot of good football at Baylor, and he's not a dual threat guy like Anthony Brown is, but he's been awfully effective in the pocket, and I think that's what uh, Utah wants at their quarterback uh, first and foremost. It's going to be a new identity, a new brand of football at the offensive side of the ball for Utah. And going off your point earlier, that 2019 Utah team, you're not going to be able to to, to beat that continuity they had at the running back and quarterback spot. So if with, uh, with all of that and all that talent, you still can't win the big game, like you said, it must be a bit disheartening for Utah fans as now they try the team to get back to that sort of level. Wanted to ask you to wrap up here, and we're talking with Max Brown. I'm Brian Fenley. The, the article you did with the Seattle Times, I would love to hear how long that took because as far as – it sounded like it was a long conversation in the interview that you had because you were pouring your heart out to to the reporters there. Take us through the, the creation of this article. And again, if anybody has Google, just type in Max Brown, Seattle Times, read the article. It, it's a must. No, I appreciate you saying that too. It's been, been a, a special couple of weeks for me that uh, for those that don't know, I grew up in the Seattle area. And so Growing up, the high school ranks, uh, my team, and through a lot of the, some great state championships and whatnot, spent a lot of time with the Seattle Times over the years. So it was cool. And obviously, I haven't really talked to him. I'm living down here in L.A., went to USC. And so it's kind of been like a six-year gap, seven-year gap, uh, so to speak. And so this was really kind of a full circle moment. And it stemmed from uh, the power of social media. And social media obviously gets uh, portrayed in a negative light these days. But Mike Burrell, the author of that article, um, stumbled upon one of the videos that I make talking about um, for, I talk a lot about both X's and O's football wise, but I also talk about the reality is uh, I was a big five-star recruit. I was uh, 
I mean, we talked about Ty Thompson, even more higher expectations than that. Things didn't necessarily work out for my playing career. And so I talk on the subject of kind of life after that. And it struck a chord with Mike and he, he wanted to write that kind of uh, featured piece. And it was super cool to his credit. We talked on the phone for probably three hours. I'm wow. um, talking about my recruiting story, talking about the SC days, talking about um, the benching. And it's a story about my playing career, both the climb and he, he kind of segments it off into three, uh, three sections. It's the, the fairy tale, the fall and kind of the, the post post football life, I guess you could say. And it was super cool because it's a story about my career, but it's also kind of this, Hey, um, recruiting and expectations in the year 2021, it's a different ball game than where it was a decade ago, but even especially kind of 20 years ago before the internet age. And yeah. um, we're seeing a lot of guys get a lot of hype early on. And when it, when it works out, it's great. Makes for awesome fairy tale stories. But when it doesn't, it leaves guys. And I, I've seen it firsthand that uh, find themselves in their life in some tough spot and they really have to kind of uh, dig themselves out. And so it was kind of a, a really uh, holistic kind of uh, article and meant a lot to me. And it was uh, been getting some good feedback. So I appreciate you kind of shouting it out. Yeah, I would think it also it would have to have a, a level of uh, being cathartic as well. And with the emergence of social media, and, it, and, and, and you would know much better than me, Max, here, but I would think that it would amplify mistakes from these recruits. So, and, and I think this was something that you had said recently as well, is that like if you were being recruited as a, as a, as a five-star 20 years ago, there's going to be pressure but you're not going to be as scrutinized because social media wasn't there as you are today. But here's the thing. You know this. You're making an incredible rebound. You're an inspiring force in sports media, and you've got a lot of big things in your future, and you don't need me to tell you that. Max Brown, appreciate you giving your, your insights on this Pac-12 football season coming up in a few months. Obviously, a lot of the teams are, are engaging in spring ball right now. I'm Brian Fenley. Let's do this again, man. Appreciate you, and thank you so much for your time. It was a blast, man. Love, uh, love talking ball and appreciate the, uh, the shout outs as well. And yeah, hope to do it again. So hope to do it again soon. Excuse me.